buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no hold on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body Hello, you guys. Mo Isom Aiken here again. I'm in the exact same outfit because I'm filming this five minutes later, but you saw the first word Monday, and I'm so glad that you're here gathered on Wednesday again as we continue to press in and unpack really important topics, important conversation. Um, it's a privilege, it's a joy to navigate sex, sexuality, singleness, relationships, what that looks like, how that can and should play out in the life of a believer. And so I pray that the words on Monday shared um, ministered to you, that the Holy Spirit ministered specifically to your heart, that they challenged you and encouraged you and equipped you. Um, and caused you to seek uh, the heart of the Father in even greater in greater depth. I, I believe that the word today, as we continue to press into 1 Corinthians, will also hopefully unpack some understanding as I share another layer of testimony in how the Lord uh, taught these very lessons to me. But I would love to again open in prayer, and then uh, we'll dive into the Word of God together as well as unpack what it looks like to walk out uh, a life of purity, a life of activation, what it looks like to walk out our life, whether single or in a relationship, well and for the glory of God. So let's pray and then we will jump in again. Heavenly Father, again, we come to you, Lord, and we praise you. We thank you for today. We thank you that your mercies are new every single morning, that your grace is sufficient, that the power of your blood is above all, is greater, that you are sovereign, you are in control, uh, and that you know the deepest depths of our heart, that you knit us together in our mother's womb, and that you know the plans and purpose that you intend over our lives. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you administer to each and every heart watching, listening, tuned in, leaning in to receive truth from your word today. Uh, I pray that you would give sight to the blind, 
that you would clear ears and let them hear your voice clearly, that you would renew minds, transform hearts, redeem bodies, Father, that you would do what only you could do by allowing your word to come like a double-edged sword, sharp enough to divide bone and marrow, Lord, and that it would do holy heart work, surgery on us, cutting out what is not of you, allowing your Holy Spirit balm to heal, to tend to us and to um, make us into truly new creations that look more like you, that look more like Christ. That is our goal, Father, to know healing and wholeness by your great love. We praise you. We commit this time to you. We ask that you would speak and that you would move. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want us to look at two pieces of scripture today from 1 Corinthians 7. And they're sandwiched between some really rich instruction that Paul gives uh, for those who are married, uh, for those who are unmarried and widowed, but they're sandwiched together and they actually celebrate and help highlight the beauty of singleness in addition to these other relationship statuses. And the contentment the clarity, the activation that we can know as we walk uh, through life, through whatever our relational circumstance may be, and walk well, empowered by his great grace. These very scriptures are what compelled me to make very big decisions in my life. I shared with you all on Monday um, a, a pretty broken sexual testimony and backstory uh, that is very much a part of my story and God's great grace and redemption, as well as deeper prophetic sight that he gave as I navigated healing and wholeness and righteous living in response to his great love. Well, uh, I'd love to share that after navigating that, there was a quick switch that was flipped and suddenly I was able to walk perfectly purely and as a professed believer, never stumble in this area or in this regard, but it just wouldn't be truth. And I think that while he perfectly carries the power to deliver us of sin and to empower us to walk in truth from this very moment, as his mercies are new every morning forward, we must come into active and committed agreement with that in order that sin might not cause us to stumble, to trip up, to be ensnared again. It is a very active and engaged and dynamic walk that we are called to as believers, no matter what our relational situation looks like. We are called to, by the Holy Spirit, a life of discernment, of self-control, and of surrender. And when we uh, rest on our lures in that area, when we are lax in the area of agreeing daily, hourly with the Lord, taking our thoughts captive, surrendering them to Christ, making sure that our actions continue to uh, stand accountable, that we feel the weight of his presence, of his sight into our days. It's tremendous. It's tremendous uh, the importance of walking in this way because the disastrous result of um, not taking this seriously is different once you know Jesus than it was before. And I'll testify to that very truth in a moment. But I want us to start in 1 Corinthians 7, 7 through 9. And this is a quick uh, passage, but there's actually some really deep beauty we can glean from these words. It begins actually in 1 Corinthians 6. These are the words of Paul. And I think 6 is important because it's, a, it's important we understand what is uh, the advisement, the encouragement of Paul versus what is the command of the Lord, which is distinct. But he says, now as a concession, not a command, I say this. So basically, Paul is saying, now, as an encouragement to you, as a, a point I believe is of utmost importance, I say this to you. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. 
But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, I want us to look. What we've understood Paul has said in this moment is uh, that he is single. He is unmarried. And he is saying, I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now, if Paul is speaking of relational status, and he is referring in this text uh, to some having one type of gift, some having another, wishing that all carried the contentment, the peace, the fire, the resolve, the self-control that he did in singleness, it's really important that we allow these words to illuminate off the page to understand that each has his own gift from God. Therefore, walking in singleness is truly, walking well in singleness, I should say, as Paul did, is truly a gift from God. This means that this is a grace of God. This is an empowerment of God, a gift from him that we could walk in such a way and walk well. What that really makes clear to me is that this is not going to be by our natural inclination that we walk well in singleness. It's not going to be by our flesh that we're able to walk well in singleness with self-control, with discernment, with wisdom, with purity. It's not going to be by how far we fight, how hard we fight in our own efforts. It is going to be by the grace of God, the empowerment of God a gift from God that we may walk forward as Paul did and that it would be good and that it would be a posture, a position, a uh, relational situation in which we do not see ourselves deprived or having less than or missing out on X, Y, or Z or handicapped, basically. A lot of our culture treats singleness like it's some type of disease, but rather we would have the approach of Paul to saying, this is very good. In fact, as a concession, not a command, but as a highly encouraged facet, let it be known that it is good to be as Paul was, a gift from God by the grace of God that we could walk out our lives, our call, our purpose well in singleness. We don't hear that talk too often, but we'll unpack more of what that means and what that looks like in just a minute. I just wanted to note the beauty of what I saw highlighted when that word gift came off the page. It's by his great grace. It's by his spirit. It's by his compulsion that we can walk a single well in purity in steadfast hope, on mission, focused. He says to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, this is where a little bit of testimony comes in. I shared with you all uh, how I began to walk in a, an intimacy fast with the Lord after coming to the revelation of his great love and healing over my life and receiving him uh, by, by grace through faith. I began to walk out this season of an intimacy fast, which was so transformative, so incredible, so much work that he did in and through my life in that time. And about two years later, I met a man. Uh, not even so much by choice, almost by the insistence of a friend who wanted to introduce us. And at that point, I was so content in singleness, so full of focus, of joy, so free from the bondage of addiction to pornography, of the need for affirmation from others, of uh, all that I had navigated before. I was truly content and not even looking to be in a relationship my eyes were fixed on the Lord, and it was a beautiful season. But I was introduced to a man uh, about two years, as I said, into that intimacy fast. And uh, that man I now am married to and have three children and a fourth on the way and six years of marriage. But I was introduced to Jeremiah 
And what was really beautiful is that I could recognize he was different than all of the other men I had known or been involved with. I almost use the word peasants. It's just a rough patch to look back on, but he was set apart because I knew the heart of the father and I could see the heart of the father in him. He bore good fruit. The fruit of the spirit was on his life. It was identifiable. I could see that he loved the Lord and walked in step with the Spirit of God, not just by his words, but by his actions. And truly, I felt that there was a very special connection between the two of us. So we began to date, but the issue was that through my season of singleness, there was a bit of a self-righteousness that had welled up in me of, oh, I will, uh, I, uh, I am being made holy. Certainly, I won't struggle with these same sin struggles, these same temptations. They have no grip on me. Certainly, all that the Lord has delivered me from, I would not return to. Certainly, I am strong enough. I am able to carry myself in purity, even in a relationship, especially because it's a Christian relationship, right? That was my mentality. And because of that, we failed to have really important conversations about boundaries, about uh, the depths of our past, about our needs for the future, how not to be triggered, how not to be put in compromising situations. Uh, truly, we just failed to talk things through in greater depth before we were uh, caught up in the passion. Really, just as it says, burning passion uh, that quickly overtook two very human people attracted to one another and resting on the lures of that Holy Spirit armor. And we began to struggle in some ways with sexual sin. And I remember very quickly feeling very different in this relationship, struggling once again with the very sins that two years ago I had surrendered. It felt very different, the weight of conviction that I felt. You see, pre-Jesus, struggling in sexual sin, I didn't like the consequences. I didn't like the physical feelings. I didn't like the emotional detachment. I didn't like the reputation that was born. I didn't like, uh, again, sort of the echoes of what that sin caused in my life. But now, in Christ, it was different there was a conviction that was so heavy, so disorienting, because it was rooted in the purity of the love that I had known. And I could hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, don't you know? I have more for you. Remember the hour that you first came to believe. Remember where you've come from. Remember what you've journeyed through. Remember my great grace. There's more for you than this. This roller coaster ride now of navigating conviction as two believers who our flesh would overtake us and then the weight of, of conviction would come like crushing defeat. And we began this roller coaster ride, I would call it, of um, struggling and then coming back to the foot of the cross, repenting, grieving, asking for God's forgiveness and walking well for a while, but then struggling again and crawling back to the foot of the cross again. And it was so disorienting. It caused me to feel this chasm in my nearness to the Lord. It caused me to grow resentful. It caused me to feel frustrated. It caused me to feel separated from my God. And yet, I chose many of those actions many times and failed in navigating self-control. And I remember coming across Proverbs 26, 11 that really put the fullness of what I was feeling into words. It says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. I felt foolish because I knew the truth. There's other scripture that speaks of like better to have never known righteousness, to have never known the conviction of sin and to walk in the ways of the Lord than to know that and choose again sin. It, I believe, again uses the terms that it's like a dog returning to its vomit. And I just thought the weight of this is crushing. It's overwhelming. And many believers, I think, feel this conviction. 
But what's beautiful and what we can stand in and feeling the weight of that is there is a part of us that is fighting with the compulsion to honor God. We actually do care. Conviction's a sign that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to you, this is not it. There's different, there's more, there's better. And there is a part of us, the spirit within us, that is known communion with that spirit of God that says, yes, I I testify to this. This testifies to my spirit. I know this is true. There is more. There is better. I feel a spirit-led compulsion to honor God. And I want to advise and encourage anyone who is in this very similar season or navigating this to not quench the Holy Spirit, but to respond. Our whole lives and the trajectory of how we had been living shifted when we chose to respond, to no longer ride this roller coaster, but by the grace of God to say enough is enough. We need to go to his word. We need to separate for a time. We need to seek first the kingdom of heaven and let all that he intends be added or what he intends be removed. It's the Lord who gives and the Lord who takes away. And so we would only be fools, foolish to repeat our folly if we kept on this cycle. We need to separate, get apart, and seek the Lord. And we did that for several months. And as I turned to the word and sought truth, it was this very scripture that I came across. To the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And even considering Monday's scripture that we saw a fleeing sexual immorality for our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I saw two options when I studied the word that we could either flee or marry. The word of God makes it very clear in how we are to steward ourselves as believers, that we are to flee from sexual immorality, that it is better not to burn with lust or that we are to marry, to make covenant in the sight of God that we would be honoring to his ways and to his truth. And, you know, we hear that and we're like either, whoa, we're not ready for that. We're in our relationship. That seems like too much. That's a big ask. We're not in the season. We don't have the money. I don't think, I think we can continue to just navigate this gray area for a while. No, it will be death. If you do not feel the compulsion to marry, the scripture compels us to flee to break off, break away, run from that which is so easily entangling us. It's bigger than just the people, the person. It's the sin that is holding jurisdiction in your heart, that is gaining ground, the prostitute that we are becoming one flesh with by the Spirit. But no, we saw two options, flee or marry. And another school of thought might think, well, great, marry, and that'll fix everything. And we'll stand at the altar and it will all be better. And yay, we get to live happily ever after. Well, that's not quite the case either. See, marriage is a covenant commitment. It is very serious in the eyes of the Lord. And just because you say I do doesn't mean that all of the baggage lands there at the altar and you turn a new page and everything's different. No, things have to be worked through. Things have to be healed. There is work to be done to align ourselves with the ways and the will of God. So really what we're looking at in choice if we're navigating sexual sin is to flee or to marry. And what that equates to is to die to self or to die to self. Oh, you mean like Christ? who called us to take up our cross and to carry it, to be crucified with him, to lose our life that we may find it. Yes, to flee sexual immorality, to navigate singleness well, looks like in many ways death to self, a death to the passions of my flesh, a death to the burning desires, a death to all of the things that please the worldliness within me. It is to walk with discipline, with discernment, with prayerful petition, with surrender, with obedience, leading our way and guiding our steps, walking in step with the Spirit, just as Galatians 5.25 says. But to marry as well is death to self. It's a covenant that is made to reflect the gospel that says, I will lay down my life, lay down my life for the, the building of another, that it's not about me anymore, 
It's about what God is doing in this unification, in this marriage covenant, and how he desires to reflect his covenantal love to the world. There's sacrifice. There's a lot of sacrifice involved. It's two becoming one, and that is not always easy ground. And there's a lot of healing that needs to be operated and moved through if sin and brokenness has been a part of that story. And so the choice was to die to self or to die to self. In both situations, what was going to be yielded was self-control. The very thing that Paul says is so hard to attain, if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. But to be single and walk singleness well, gifted and graced by God, births in us self-control because we learn how to deny the flesh so the spirit may rise, how to deny what is not of God so righteousness may lead and lord our story. But also if marriage is what is chosen, better than to burn with lust, self-control is what must be learned and leaned into and held on and born of that option as well. You see, God desires deeply to minister to all of us in the area of self-control. It's essential. It stretches beyond sex. It stretches beyond singleness. It stretches beyond marriage. It permeates the life of a believer to say, not my will, but yours be done. Not my desires, but your desire, God. Not what I want when I want it, a self-satisfying life and walk, but what you want when you want it, Father, how you want it. Lead my life, Lord my life. I will submit my life unto you. Submission and self-control. We hate these words, but guess what? To live as a yielded Christ follower, all of us must come under the beauty of those invitations. And the great joy is that his leadership, his husbandry of us is perfect, faithful, sure, a provider, a protector, whether he gifts us with the grace and power to walk singleness well, or whether we learn through the incredible covenant, gospel covenant of marriage, how to walk well alongside another. In all instances, what God's desiring is to birth self-control, to mature us, to deepen our roots, to refine us and sanctify us, to empower us to do his will. If we move over to 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 35, we see this. Paul's continuing on by saying, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. You see what's very true here. <laughs> is that he's saying in marriage, it comes with things that steal and pull our attention. It comes with layers and depths of navigating relationship with another. It comes with things that might divert our full and undivided affections unto the Lord to carry out things that are good and things that are beneficial and wonderful and edifying also. But it is a portion we pick up to carry with us all the days of our life. And in singleness, there's the ability to solely be anxious about the things of the Lord, how to do his will, his work, how to carry out the mission that we are on. And there is not the same type of uh, divided loyalty, for lack of a better word, or divided thought or energies. Man, add three kids onto the equation too and you'll really learn about the division of our energy in the waking hours. 
and at night. It's a lot. You'll never sleep again. I love them. It's worth it. But man, we see in even this passage the beauty of what he's emphasizing, that in singleness, we can know undivided attention unto the Lord's way, his will. Father, what is your call upon our lives? What is the mission you've set before me? What are the plans and purposes that you've ordained? What do you want to work out within my heart? What are you sanctifying? Who am I to serve? Whom am I to love? Where would you have me go? Yes, Lord, send me. This is what the text says. This was what made those seasons of of intimacy fasting, of, of time solely with the Lord so beautiful because I could say, yes, Lord, send me. And there was nothing impeding response to that. Now, don't get me wrong. I love marriage, massive advocate for it and married. Jeremiah, if you're watching, I love you, baby boy. But the truth is there are layers that come with that choice. And I am grateful for the days where I knew undivided singleness, undivided attention unto the Lord and wasn't striving or seeking after relationships or the quick fix or the physicality. But man, I knew no restraints to walking forward, hearing from the one true lover of my soul, Yahweh, my King, my God, the spirit within me. It's that posture where we find contentment. It's that posture where we learn that All we have, all we need is him. That anything added unto that is a blessing. That we actually see a husband or a wife, if that is for our future. That we truly see them as a blessing and not an entitlement. That we walk with them well because we didn't see them as owed to us, but undeserved grace from the Lord. Man, if we can walk well in singleness, as Paul did, if we can know contentment, if we can learn self-control, if we cannot waste these days chasing the affirmation of another or the relationship status we think we should have, if we can rest and trust in the goodness of God and all that he is orchestrating, I believe we will look different, set apart from the world, missions undistracted, lives lived on fire, purpose reignited, passion found. We'll learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we'll learn to love our neighbors as ourself, the greatest two commandments. So remember, the ability to walk well through all of this is a gift, a grace from God. Lean into that grace and hold fast to it and seek it every day because it is not done by the flesh, not by power, not by might, but by his spirit. We can carry this out. Know that there are options in light of sexual sin, flee, or marry. Better to marry than to burn with lust. But in all circumstances, remember, he is working to form us. And from within us, birth self-control. Don't waste your days, no matter your relationship status. In singleness, don't waste your days. Learn self-control over your body, your heart your mind, your spirit. Surrender to his control. Walk in step with him and he will make your path straight. I hope you guys have a blessed week and may his mercy and his grace be upon you.